beginning at three. three. Yes. Mark here for Mark 2.0, Gordon's in Ontario, Canada. And we have the legend himself. Oh, we had. Hey, we had the legend himself. Hold on. Mark here for Mark 2.0. Gordon is in Ontario, Canada. And we have the legend himself from the hit group Redbox, Simon Toulson Clark. You may remember his hits, Lean on Me for America from uh, Circle in the Square, uh, albums like Plenty, Chasing the Setting Sun. Simon, welcome to the podcast. Let's start out by talking about your journey and how this all started, Redbox. Well, I, I suppose it started um, when I began to play the guitar, would have been probably about 13 years old, I suppose. Uh, and I was I was a singer in the choir, you know, uh, so I, I love music. I come from a musical family. Uh, my grandfather was a conductor of uh, classical orchestras. Um, and so I suppose I grew up with music and making my own was really inspired by hearing the records, the great records when I was becoming uh, becoming a teenager, the, between the age of, I would say, 13 to like 20, you're just like a sponge for everything new that's coming. So those, those, that, that era of music was extraordinary in terms of its, it was an explosion of um, self-propelled creativity. Uh, and uh, uh, there are moments of creativity in the current music climate, but they're often not self-propelled. So that, era of people writing their own material being in charge of how it sounded where producers and artists found a genuine partnership in creating the, the best sounding music that, that they possibly could uh, i think that era really inspired me and i would say because i have an older sister that i really grew up listening to the beatles and the stones um, and and dylan and Joni mitchell and neil young um, and then I found my own uh, heroes in the in the very early 70s and the late 60s. Jimi Hendrix um, really loved a uh, singer songwriter. I'm sure you guys know about Buffy Saint Marie. I really loved Don McLean. Um, so Carl yeah. Stephen is in there. Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, it's sort of all mixed up. And then I also had a real love for music from everywhere around the world. We call now world music. Um, but in those early days, you had to really hunt it down. And I brought some of those styles um, into Redbox, into the sound of Redbox, to attempt to make a kind of um, a bigger idea statement. No, that's me. <laughs> kind of a fusion of different musical styles from different corners of the globe? Well, I think that that first album is, you know, it boldly goes, does it not? You know, <laughs> yeah. into all of those, yes. into every corner of sound around the world. You know, I'm I'm not saying it should, it's that makes it better or worse, but that was certainly within our method, um, our method, and it was certainly within our hopes that we could uh, make an album that looked beyond our own small room. And I think part of the reason, I know it's a very physical reason, and maybe an over obvious parallel to draw but i do think it actually applies when we were students and we were first redbox was just forming as an idea we lived in a very tall building in west london you know in notting hill in fact and that tower block we were on the top but one floor 19th floor it was 20 floors in the building and it afforded the most amazing view our our balcony looked east uh, right across the whole of London, we could see everything right down to Tower Bridge, um, St Paul's Cathedral Dome, south of the river and the Downs, going down towards Brighton. I mean, it was a huge view. And I think, as I did, doing my 10,000 hours of playing guitar and creating sounds with early samplers in that little space, I think I was sort of you know it was an inevitability that i looked beyond it and and looked at ideas that i thought um 
I mean, it's an idea that I still really cling to, which is that it's fantastic how many differences we all have everywhere over the world, not just in the things we like to do and the kind of music we like to listen to, but in so many ways. And yet there are far more things that we have in common with, with people who come from very diverse backgrounds, with different beliefs. Uh, and and so I th I think that's a really interesting area, you know, and I probably if I had to be to say what is that album about, it is about that. Just, you know, lift your head and that's what I want for myself and my daughter, just that we can lift our heads and make up our own minds. So it did make sense to draw on all of those cu uh, um, cultural references that the new technology of fair light and sampling allowed us to experiment with. And I, one of my favourite reviews of Redbox was a Rolling Stone review by a guy, I forget his name now, but uh, anyway, thank you, whoever it was, who did like the album a lot. And he said it is, if anything, like a slightly less stern Peter Gabriel LP. But of course, Peter Gabriel, I absolutely hero worship. I think he's just, you know, fantastic, amazing. Uh, so I'm not in any way comparing yes. what I've done my output to Peter Gabriel. But I think <laughs> that there were a number of people around the world at that time exploring the same ideas. And, and some of that was technologically driven and some of it was politically inspired and i mean that sort of social politics rather than national politics does that make sense uh, i'm curious as to how you can yes how how did the name red box come along when a band is, when you're deciding on a name yeah you, how did we, you come up with red box we had a lot of trouble finding a name for the band uh, it was called various different things at various different times uh, in, the, uh, in the first few months. But um, we knew that we had to find a good name. Um, and I suppose this would have been in the very early 80s, which was the formative years of the band. Um, we had a list on the, on the door of our rehearsal room. And anybody who thought had a, a movie, uh, of a band name, would put the lip it on the list. I suppose there were 20 or 30 ideas. And the the person I was the downer in, I was the bad guy in the room. Because every, everybody would say, what about this one? The um, you know, the pink cactus. And I'm going, I don't really like that. It's a bit prickly, you know, it's a bit pink. It's uh, and I would have a hundred reasons for not choosing any of these names. And then somebody, um, the drummer in the band said, thing is, Sai, if if somebody pointed at anything in this rehearsal room um, and said that could be a name, you would say, no, that's just too, it's too, deep. like that's a piece of furniture, but the doors. And he, so he gave a brilliant example of pointing at something in the room, the door, and he goes, the doors. Okay, you know, have we overlooked an obvious thing here? And we're, we're all looking around the room and then he goes, like for instance, red box. And, and he was pointing at a red flight case that we, um, we inherited from the, the glam rock band Slade um, because they came and played a concert at our university and left this big flight case. And we, we took it and for about three months, we had, didn't have a name for it. It was just the microphone box. We put all the microphones, all our cabling in it. And it's an absolute perfect square. And it is the deep red of of our, our particular color that we use in our artwork, red in the name. And uh, so he was pointing at that and, uh, you know, everybody kind of went, that's quite a good idea actually. And I was also, because I'm, I've always um, been interested in and, and uh, been a sort of amateur student of um, Native American history and uh, possible future. And with that, I think uh, being, sort of stimulated probably by Buffy St. Marie and the, the, the content in her songs lyrically, which made me just want to explore what she was talking about and what she was a little ticked off about at times and also what she was beautifully inspired by. Um, so I was sort of drawn to her. I think partly she has an, an incredible and brilliant sense of melody. And I, and, uh, I think Redbox has always been a melodic band, first and foremost. 
and um, I did particularly like the rhythmic way she used her voice. And I found other singers and, and musicians and bands hugely influential on my own uh, tenor mm -hmm. music, but probably no more, uh, no one more than Buffy uh, in terms of sitting down with a guitar and creating something with just that instrument and the voice. I think she was amazing at it and still is. Uh, so that's where the name came from. With that interest in her music, I learned uh, in a book um, uh, called, I think, Strange Man of the Oglala. It's actually a biography of Crazy Horse. It's a fantastic book written by a, a lady called Mary Sandals, I think in the early 1900s. And she had been a child on her farm, farm, farm and he was a, a kind of liberal farmer and had allowed some of the Sioux uh, tribe to the remains of them to have a bit of land and have a camp. And she would go down and listen to stories. And one or two of those old guys had actually been at the, la at the Battle of the Big Horn and, and talk talked about Crazy Horse and his life. And she was inspired to write the book. And in that book, it said it, there, had, there was a symbolism where, where the Native American symbol for man was a circle, but for his, 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 uh, their symbol for white man was a square. And I thought the circle and the square is such a, it's, you know, it's an amazingly simple set of lines to make those drawings. But what they say in terms of the contrast and the problem uh, is just amazing, you know. So I thought it was really very, um, and obviously it's symbolic, but I thought it just was a really powerful symbol. So I wrote a song called The Circle and the Square about, about these things, about the differences and, and, the, and the similarities and the, the reason to appreciate one another. Um, and uh, that is how the name became acceptable because uh, the circle and the square, the red box, um, we kind of felt was in some way I think that at some point we're all Marxists at, at university and then some of those beliefs have survived and, and some of them have, have, uh, have kind of, you know, in, been improved upon uh, through experience. So I think it still fits, but that was certainly a, a reason to use it back, back in the day. Uh, and of course, because everybody was telling us we needed to get an A. Well, um, just to jump in, as a composer, singer, songwriter, and you have, but you're also, you have ideology, you have political ideas, environmental ideas, human ideas. You, there's a tension there between trying to create something which is appealing, that will be commercial, that will sell, but at the same time incorporating in these ideas like a circle and a square and if you could just talk to that tension between those two, fitting the idea behind the song into the music and trying to get something that people will listen to. Well, like, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good way to sum up what the challenge is in, you know, in, in inventing music and trying to make a recording of it that is true to how you hear it and what you feel in your heart as you're, as you're doing it. Um, and that is really record making and, and why it's so great sometimes when it goes well and so, you know, incredibly frustrating when it doesn't. Um, I think the tension comes, I've always thought that a good red box song are the ones where there's almost like two ideas running alongside and sometimes crossing over. And sometimes it's one of those two ideas cross that is the most fertile place, you know. So. I think we are sonically driven, and then from that, from the sounds we're making and the, and the speed of a song and the temperature of a song, the feel of a song, you know, rhythmically, I think we kind of find our, our I find a fairly early on some way of singing over those ideas that, you know, suggests in my mind's eye as I'm doing um, ideas. And I think when you write like that in real time, where you basically improvise, and some, most of it I'm recording in some form or another, and then um, it's about being a good fisherman and going back, actually, played for an hour there, but those three minutes there are, are a song. 
and then trying to draw out the the meanings um, and making sure that that melody really really works with the feeling that in the lyric so it's getting that those two things to work really well and i think that's when we make we manage to make music anyone you know from the beatles onwards um that that connects with people there's certain certain changes and certain mood changes in in contemporary and popular music shall we call it that from as I define this in this conversation from the early 60s to certainly a, a high point, the early 60s to the mid 70s and some great stuff actually in the second half of the 70s too, could argue in the 80s. Um, although the 80s had a, te a technologically a different sound of music, I think there were still some very good songs being written. I'm not sure that there's, that, that um, that the good songwriting now is in the mainstream. And one of the things that was really going for us was that if you were a songwriter and you had a record deal, you could have your songs in the mainstream. And, and yes. now I think music is very, it's so niche, it's so fragmented. It's become like the leaf, every niche is like a leaf on a tree. There were so many. And, and that ubiquity is hard to therefore get ever again, maybe. Um, I mean, I, I hope there will be a unifying way to listen to music uh, at some point. I think then it's more powerful because it was so great back in the 80s, you know, if you had a hit. I remember the record company saying to me, you know, Lean On Me is selling over 35,000 copies a day. Right. Um, to stay in that position where it is in the high in the chart. And, you know, if you think about how many how many, what that actually means, you know, is 35,000 people. That's like a big football stadium of people every day going out and going, I actually like this enough to want to own it. So there was a kind of cultural commitment back then that, it, that perhaps there isn't now. And I think that fact that you could go on a TV show with a hit record and everyone would know the, the song. You couldn't, you literally couldn't walk down the street without people singing you a hit song if it was in the top 10 in the UK during that time. And I don't think that's true anymore. Now, did Top of the Pops play a role in helping your uh, two top 10 hits? Well, I mean, yeah, it's, you know what, Top of the Pops, is a, it's a little bit like, you know, I think I love the Jules Holland show later, um, but, you know, their claim that they kind of break people from nothing is just not true. You know, to get on that show, you need a lot of heat under the project. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there there are a lot of people who the the general public have never heard of, maybe never will, who may make it a, a, to that show and to, on to greater and bigger things, but none of them are doing it without any heat under it. True. So, you know, uh, I think Top of the Pops, it was the same thing. Pop, Top of the Pops, if you went on it, and you, you did two things, right? One was it had to be a, a, a song with popular appeal. It had to have hooks. Or, or, or the releases that come with building tensions you were talking about with songwriting. You know, if what you do is you're building a, a verse where there is tension and, and it will be released at some point, that, uh, that's, that can be equally effective as just you know, a great chord sequence of a melody. Um, I think there's all sorts of ways to, to make music that touches people. But um, Top of the Pops definitely made a hit into a big hit if you if you had such a song, and secondly, if you performed it well enough on Top of the Pops. Um, um, Top of the Pops was, was, you know, you, you would go on, you would end up going on it quite a few times um, because... In the life of one hit single, you might do it two or three times, um, really for as long as the record was going up and they liked what you did. Now, earlier when, when we first started talking, you talked about this explosion of individually driven content music coming out and you talked about being individually driven. I think that was the turn of phrase that you used. And contrasting it with now and you don't think it's as big I'm just wondering 
nowadays, anyone with a guitar and an internet connection, they don't even need a soundboard. There is so much music out there now. You talk about this, you know, fracturing of the, the music scene. Everyone is now, there are so, there are probably more self-published, more self-promoted artists now than at any point in history. And we're, their platforms are so segmented based on demographics. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I wonder, uh, I think there is some amazing music out there that's new, brand new, made by young people from everywhere. I mean, it, I'm not quite sure what's happened with the mainstream media and, and pop music. It's like, I don't know, did the late 60s and the early 70s and then punk scare the bejesus out of the establishment, the record, you know, the record business itself? Because something definitely changed after that. It became much more packaged and and less important in a way. Um, I suppose it's because we have so many other distractions and they didn't all come overnight. This has been a gradual, not an erosion of music, but an erosion. Oh, the sound went out, hold on. Somehow you have muted yourself. And yeah. Well, well, Simon or Sai or Simon gets his audio going back again. We'll just fill in the gap. Yeah. But, Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. We're back. I didn't know how to get rid of the call. It was all in Polish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. For those not aware, my, yeah, uh, Simon there we is go. connecting with his bandmates, Polish bandmates' uh, iPhone. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's how we do it, you know. Yeah, well, look, at least you can hear me. That's the main thing. Yes, sure. Well, I, I forgot what we were saying. Uh, where were we? We were talking talking about the explosion of self promoted artists, uh, yeah. independent yeah. artists. I mean, you know, in theory, the internet is a fantastic thing, and I think it will be a fantastic thing. Yeah. Uh, for us to connect with our audience. Um, sure. I think at the moment the gatekeepers on on the streaming services are not well. Firstly, they they need to adjust how much a person can make. Yeah, I think at the moment that they allow more of these people to actually make music as the main thing they do. In other words, make enough from it if you have a successful streaming track that you can make that your the focus of your work, and then you would see some amazing adventure and. Uh, perhaps um, more music being made of a higher quality. I, I don't know the answer to it. Certainly technology has allowed us to make records in a certain way. Um, and I, I can't help thinking that part of it, I remember a record executive saying to me in the 80s, um, when I, I'd made a record that, you know, we really put heart and soul into, I'd written, it took me about two, three years to, to make the record was one of the mo the longest, I mean, I'm not proud of the fact that it's one of the longest <laughs> recording sessions, but but it, it was, for the, anyone who hasn't heard this album, it's called The Circle and the Square, check it out. But it, it was the, the, the fact that we chased all these radically different styles and then tried to mold them into our English, slightly arty pop thing. I think that was what was, actually lastingly interesting about red box and why i still love being in red box is that we can try anything and so long as we make it our own sounds like us because it is us then right. that that will we'll we'll be happy with it we don't get everything right you know i i can't i don't think i listen to an old song and not think i could do better now uh so you know, it's it's what we do. We just want to keep doing it. And I think it's made it harder in a sense that there is so much music being made out there. In a way, we're just one blade of grass in a field. Um, and how, how do you how do you stand out? Um, for me, the answer, I think, is to just stay true to what we are, which is um, we, we write lots of songs before we make an album. We don't just make an album of the first 10 or 11 songs we we, we write next right we probably write i probably write uh, 30 or 40 
songs to choose 10. And I'll right. record quite a high level of complete of completion, all of those 30 or 40, in order to have a best guess which, which of them hang together, which of them have the same fingerprint on and therefore could hang together in the same album as, as and in a way make a, a, cons, a, a an idea of more consequence because there are more ways of saying it. And that's to me why I quite, you know, I quite like the idea of albums. It's a sort of, it puts a, it puts a ring fence around a period of writing and uh, perhaps a stylistically. Something I'm curious about, Simon, not to cut you off, we've lost your video, but that's okay. If you yeah, can get okay, it, fine. it's fantastic. Just makes it easier to know when to jump in. But I wanted to ask you, you said you would, you'll would you write 30 or so songs to whittle it down from those 30 to 10. Have you ever gone back and looked at something at, at the 20 or so songs that didn't make the cut from five years ago, 10 years ago, and reworked a song? Yeah, occasionally. Um, I mean, I, I'm sort of logging ideas all the time. So, um, you know, at the moment, I'm not really keeping up in terms of listening back to things with my, with the rate at which I'm committing things to tape. So going back, I do occasionally go back, actually, and there's a couple of tracks on this album. Yeah, oh, hold on. We lost the uh, audio again. Okay. Um, I was going to talk about uh, while we wait for... Simon to get back on, you know, it's an interesting conversation. Uh, you talk about the evolution of music in the eighties, being an eighties kid myself. The one song I think- Here we go. Emblematic of that era. All right. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, there we go. Now we got the audio back. And if yeah, ever- my, my Polish friend, Mikhail. Mikhail, come and put your face yeah. in here. I, I'm, uh, I'm Polish too, Mikhail. Uh, oh, last name is Bozak, B-O-Z-E-K. Okay. Yeah. And, and I know the word Jinku Yang. So <laughs> Jinku Yang. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's all my that's all my Polish. Okay. Yeah. And what is your so, what is your word? We we met in quite a funny way, actually. Wow. Explain um, it. Well, I made an album, we made an album called Plenty. Yeah. In my in a studio I built in my house in London. Right here. Okay. No, that's Chase the Setting Sun. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, wait. Plenty. I got it. <laughs> that's yeah. it. And, um, yeah, and that photograph on the front is yeah. a photograph my wife took on a beach in Thailand of wow. our feet. And that, although they look like molds, they're not. They're, they're actually depressions in the sand. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, um, so I went out and we've always had a a, a very loyal and enthusiastic fan base in Poland because some point in the early 80s when there was a, a great change there um, one of our songs called Chenko became a big hit there and and as a consequence they've they've paid attention to everything we've done since and they like everything we've done since so we have a status there um, we're certainly bigger relatively there than we are in England. I think our mo most fans are in England, but uh, yeah, the joys of technology. But we're still we still have audio. Do we? Um, well, you and I do. Yeah, it it should be coming right back for Simon. This yeah, is I, so I, enjoyable. I, 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 I'm not familiar with the song you were talking about, Simon. That is so popular in, in that touch things off for you in Poland, but I remember what was happening in Poland in the 80s with Lech Walesa and the Solidarity Movement. And yeah, we don't have audio from uh, Simon at the moment. We don't have audio? No. All right. So. So we go back to me singing the 80s hit song, da, da, da. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Oh, now we lost uh, what you will Simon altogether. So. Uh-huh. We can pause things and wait until they come back. Yeah. And Sounds I can good. fix Hold the on. horrible lighting. Yeah. And we're back. Simon, welcome back. 
Third time's yeah. the charm. I'm bringing Mick Al in because I was he fixed that technical issue. Yeah. <laughs> Mick, Mick, Al, Mick Al, um, and I met when I went to promote a record in Poland. And he was working for a, he was a music journalist. He, he is a music journalist. Um, who now has his own show on the national radio there. Um, but at that time, uh, he was just coming, I think, was what was the magazine? Yeah, it was the music magazine, monthly music magazine. Yeah, the monthly, the monthly, uh, the best monthly magazine in Poland. And he interviewed me in Warsaw about the new record. And we, we kind of, we hit it, we liked each other. And he said, maybe I'll come and see your first uh, gig on the tour. And uh, we said, great, yeah, you know. And then he sort of was in the dressing room. Um, wow. And we were talking about which songs we would play. And we decided we, we couldn't really do a song called Plenty unless we had a tambourine in it. Um, and Mikhail said, well, um, I could play the tambourine. So he, 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 he got his first opportunity with Redbox on the tambourine, I think, and uh, then went to Tom Toms because he is a drummer and a percussion player. Okay. And he's also a very good guitar player. So he now, and, and some keyboards. So he plays a mixture of things with us, some percussion, some guitar, and some samples and keyboards and stuff. So he's a talented guy and we were lucky to meet him. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Now, well, <laughs> Simon, what was the number one hit pulling off of uh, Plenty? Well, look, there were two. There were two, but at that time, in the story I've just told you, it was the song called The Sign. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, mm. uh, we got to. Yeah, we keep getting interrupted and don't want to be here all day with technical issues. We've got to get in. You, you, we talk. You talked about this fusion of music and ideas and concepts and trying to bring everything together. How did you get um, your, your, your uh, follower? You were a fan of the com American comedian, Bill Hicks. Yeah, I'm a big fan. And you tried to bring in his comedic. He, he, Bill Hicks, for those who aren't aware, was a very political, very socially active comedian and to then now you're taking his comedic political ideas and trying to fusion them in with your music your musical well, voice you know, well, I, that's yes I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it's you know I love buildings um but actually I, I actually think it was more about when I first saw Bill Hicks I I was blown away, firstly, by how great he was and how funny he was, because that's, let's face it, that's the main objective. But, yeah. uh, but also, he was talking about, it was almost like if I had the skills to be funny about it, instead of writing music, I would be saying what Bill Hicks is saying. Right. Because I'm with him about almost everything. So um, I, it wasn't a conscious decision. I'm I didn't ever think at one moment I was going to make a record um, as a tribute to Bill Hicks after, after he died. He actually died during the period we were making the record. And as a consequence, and I, I'd been using some of his sample, uh, uh, the occasional sample word from him. Um, I, uh, he died and I thought it was a nice thing to do to, to make the am album uh, dedication to his to him and his memory. You know, I think I urge everybody who can laugh at anything to uh, Google Bill Hicks and his, his routines, you know, just an, an amazing, amazingly powerful and talented comedian. And with a lot to say, some, sometimes it takes, you know, th that's an interesting comparison, using comedy as a way to make political commentary. Yeah. And it's the same, you know, using music to make political commentary. They're two powerful platforms to... Well, they're not, and they're, and they're, they're, interestingly, they're, there's a real similarity yes. um, between why that works. Um, because if I, you know, I think in a song, the best songs for me 
people and, that, and what, certainly what I try and do when I'm when I'm creating music and songs is I want to make something um, that has you know preferably something interesting to say uh, and, but I'm not going to just come out with it in such bald terms because that there's no poetry in that there's no poeticism and I actually it would be a criticism that I would level at current mainstream pop music as on the top on the billboard top 14 and uh, in our in our chart on the spotify you know uh, certainly we have a radio station called radio one and their 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 hit their their top 20 for me is the lyrically we've sort of lost that idea of alluding to something so everything is extremely ex explicit i don't mean that sexually sometimes it is but i mean that they say in lyrics, uh, you know, you might say it's not uncommon to hear uh, boy singers, male singers, sort of in a very apologetic tone, talking about how they're hurt and um, how you hurt me, you left me, you know, my life is nothing without you. Now, that to me is not lyric writing. That is that is almost like prose, um, and it's like somebody's boring diary. So, <laughs> I think is that it's much better to, to, if you want to allude in a lyric in a poetic sense, and maybe with more power than the actual words, my girlfriend left me and I'm really upset over it and I, because I blame myself, um, then maybe you say in the lyric, that smiley face you drew on my mirror, when it's cold in the house, it reappears. Right? Okay. And then, <laughs> That, that that is a maybe i mean i'm not saying that is a lyric but you know that's what you're looking for in when you i write lyrics i'm trying to find and if i find something where you could take it two or three ways i'm absolutely delighted because i want to i want there to be lots of little roots away from the central theme in it if i can do that and sometimes i do it by accident and sometimes i do it by design and most of the time it's a bit of both yeah now, you had brought up earlier, you, you used the term gatekeepers in terms of the, the mainstream platforms. We yeah. use the word platforms now. We didn't used to use the word platforms. We used yeah. to just, it was the radio station executives, the programming directors, the, you know, the studio heads. And yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, in a, in a, they're deaf tossers. They've got all the wrong people doing the job. It's yeah. as simple as that. And so the question I wanted to put, put to you is now you have an idea. Like, let's take, uh, we mentioned Peter Gabriel before, and let's look at a song that is pretty well known, I think, Biko. And at that time, you know, if you look back to the early 80s when South Africa was blowing up, when it was just coming entering into the consciousness of a guy like me who had you know what do i know about south africa what do i know about nelson mandela what do i know about stephen biko and those gatekeepers can decide well we don't want we don't agree with the political stance with what is being put out in this music and so mm -hmm. we're going no we're not going to give that radio play i don't want you to produce that song yeah. I mean, there's, you know, this kind of thought management, it's nothing new. No. But it, but it is, it has an absolute iron grip in the music, in the popular music business. And, and it's in trouble. And, I, and I've got a friend uh, who's my age and he's in publishing. He works for a very big publisher, British, well, international, actually American company. Uh, but in Britain, um, he's quite a big wig there. And he was saying, you know, we we actually are slightly terrified in the publishing business when we look at the fact that most of the income that comes from music streaming is for heritage product in other words it's back cattle so now, now that, there's nothing you know in what in a sense that's not surprising because obviously back cattle provides the majority of the of the uh, streamable music but at the same time the proportions are not right in other words to uh, lots of people are still returning to those amazing decades 
uh, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And every era produced some great music. There were moments in that time where it exploded, as we've discussed, you know, and I, again, I say early 60s to mid 70s was a particular peak of a certain kind of music making. Um, yeah. But I think it might have been the last era where the musicians and the songwriters got to make their statement in exactly the way they wanted and exactly the pace they wanted. Um, and record companies in those days, they would certainly say, well, we, we really like this song as, as the single. They would, you would want that input. And a good, incidentally, you know, I'm not anti-major label. I, when I was on a major label, I had a couple of people there who I got on with and I thought really talked a lot of sense. And they made massive difference to my um, output and to what I made on record. You know, they definitely introduced me to people who knew more than I did about making a record. And I sucked it up like blotting paper. And um, so it's not, you know, the, the, the issue is that sometime in the 80s, record companies started to realise they could actually manufacture this pop, this thing called pop. Because, you know, actually, if, if all you have on the mainstream shelf is white bread, guess what? People will eat white sliced bread, as was proven throughout the 50s, you know. If, yes. all you serve, if all you serve is processed food or processed music, think of it as brain food. You would never feed your children constantly processed food. Like, you know, no one should live on McDonald's. No one should live on the, we all need to eat fresh food. It's, it's brain food. Well, I, I would say music is brain food. I mean, any culture is, but music's particularly special because you get that direct route from someone's heart right into yours. And film can't do that because there's hundreds of people involved. Books maybe can do that. You know, you know, books, sometimes I'm in another world when I'm involved in a good book. Um, but I think songs are like that. They, they're truly immersive. And uh, there's no more powerful uh, trigger to memory than people hearing songs from, from their youth or from earlier in their lives. I get that all the time when we play festivals. People come up at the meet and greet and go, wow, you know, these songs that I thought would be gone in weeks or months have, have somehow managed to last. And they're not, yeah. even my, they're not even my best ones. That's what's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, these are the ones that got the support of a major label who knew, that, knew how to sell something. Okay. And, but, but the bottom line is people really liked the songs and they sold in vast quantities. I don't think that's the game anymore. I think you have to now, instead of selling one tiny little part of yourself, in other words, one song, the single, to yes. millions of people around the world, I think now it's about finding the few, the tribe, to whom you matter a great deal. And I think you sell them everything about yourself. You sell them the acoustic version. You sell them the deluxe version, the vinyl version, the double vinyl version. <laughs> you invite them backstage, you invite them onto the stage, you invite them to the studio. And that, that's what we do with our fans. It's yeah. like a family. That, that's awesome. It, you're, you're talking, we had a conversation with um, with Greg Kane of um, Hugh and Cry. Cry. And it's very, what, you, what you're talking about is very akin to what they were talking about, how the relationship between the fans, their fans, and them, and, uh, and Greg and his brother, you know, similar to what you're achieving with Redbox, a much more intimate relationship with your fans. Yeah. Although I'm sure there's a, a part of you that when you gets up at one of those festival shows and you're playing to 20, 30,000 fans, you must have a moment where you feel like, wow, this, I am Peter Gabriel. I am the Rolling Stones. Oh, no, yeah. I, I am the Beatles. I always was in my head, you know. But, but um, it's funny that uh, maybe the best thing ever, if you've written a song, um, is that you get up in, yeah, I, I'm doing these festivals every Saturday, which are basically people just do the songs that are well known. So yeah. in terms of a ticket, it's really good value because 
this, you don't sit around at this festival going, I wish they play something I recognize. Yeah. I wish that, <laughs> I'm waiting, I've wait, waited through 11 album tracks for the one that I really love. You know, and I'm, <coughs> I have many artists that I love almost everything they do, but there is no artist that I love that I don't also hate some of their material. And um, so maybe I'm just like kind of Marmite fan, but you've got to, I think when you make music, you've got to try and remember that you are first and foremost a music fan and you've just got to do what makes the hairs on the back of your neck rise and hope there's a few geezers out there who agree. Yeah. And one thing that you touched upon, which is so true, is I just recently went to Mid Jury and uh, Howard Jones concert out here. And Nick Beggs was playing with uh, Howard Jones. Anyways, Mid Jury opens up with, of Ultra Rocks. He opens up with Reap the Wild Wind, you know, because that was the only hit in the US. And you're, yeah. but luckily he played some of the other hits, but you hit it right what on the nose. Was the Vienna a hit in the US? No, uh, if it was, it was not a top four. That, well, I don't think so because Reap the Wild Wind was like 92 on the top 100. That's interesting because, you know, I mean, it was a massive record here. Yeah. Oh, it was huge. I think it was all over Europe. It was huge. Yeah. Yeah. One no, thing we I, forgot I, to talk I, about, I, Simon. What about gonna, Saskatchewan? That became about, a hit in Canada. Right. Yeah, but that's, that's yes. Is that because it's a Canadian songwriter? You think? Oh uh, well, it could be because it's a Canadian province too, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I don't think there's any guarantee. If I if I sang kind of, you know, I, I don't know. If I had Quebec in the title of the song, would everyone <laughs> in Quebec follow that record? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a great idea to put place names in you. I always, I'm really jealous always of the Americans and Canadians because their their place names sound really cool in reference, but oh, don't. You know, <laughs> oh, I really don't. I don't know why that is, but you yeah. could take any, you could take any, like you know, Plains town name, Rocky Mountain name, and you would sound pretty cool in a song. Well, Gordon's well, in Brighton, Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. Brighton. Yeah. Well, that, that just shows a degree of unoriginality to take so many of them. <laughs> yeah. The, the the thing is, like, I remember Huey Lewis in the news. Uh, they had that song. Um, I forget what it was called, but at the end of the song, they went and said, you know, the motor to Detroit, L.A., Chicago, oh, the heart of rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. And Small that, they yeah. actually came out with a Canadian version, and then they had, and he had dropped in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, oh, wow. and it was cool. strict, you would only hear that in Canada because they wanted to get those place names in there. Sure, yeah, and it, 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 it for local radio, if their names on it. Hmm. They they yeah. they sat I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that Bruce, you know that. Although it's ironically called "Born in the USA," yes, it's never been perceived that way. You know, yeah. I mean, I bet a lot of a lot of good old boys are playing that record because they just think it says the USA in it. Mm. Yeah, oh, I, I I find Canadians we tend to be a little more. I think Americans don't have an inferiority complex at all. I think Canadians have something of an inferiority complex and we really like to see our, the name Toronto mentioned alongside Toronto, Chicago, LA, London. Yeah, well, um, I, I, think, um, I think you're right. Um, I think that we call that self-awareness. Um, so we think it's normal to have that kind of questioning um, mentality about oneself and, and maybe yeah you're probably right in the US there is a little less of it at times well the question I want to ask now and maybe to, to, to put a nice bow on this is obviously your music is available uh, through Amazon and through platforms are there any particular ways that fans of Redbox can connect and maybe get, the, get their music directly from you 
Well, I mean, you can go directly. I mean, you can stream our music, obviously, on Spotify. Um, and yes, Apple Music and all those platforms will have Redbox. Uh, and really, it doesn't make, you know, they're all pretty much of a similar, um, in, they're all similar in terms of what it does for us and what it does for the consumer. So that's really a matter of personal taste and uh, familiarity. So I think what I would urge you to do is go to uh, become friends with us on Facebook. If you Google, if you uh, search in Facebook for Red Box Band, Red Box Band, you will find our site and it has our snake logo. Yeah, um, that's where I got uh, these albums with your website. Cool. Yeah. Or these two. Yeah. Oh, you, okay. You got the whole collection. Then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So well, now I just need to get the t shirt. So you're missing one. Yeah. You're missing um, motive. Yeah, I am. I miss you, motive. Exactly. It hasn't come yet. I, I, I did order it. So. Okay, cool. And have you, you can't have just you go to like the used record stores in Phoenix and get Redbox, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, but you can, you know, anyway, and we also have a, um, uh, our own website. So if you just put Redbox Band website, you'll come to that. Yeah, that's where mm -hmm. I got it. And uh, now I need to get the t shirt, like I was yeah, saying. So. We just got we just commissioned some new t-shirts. They're pretty pretty cool actually. Oh, excellent! So we're, we're yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, the, one of the things I was going to say about um, Canada is that although we have we've always had some fans in Canada because they get in touch with me, and initially those conversations were about Buffy Saint Marie because I've been a persistent defender in covering her songs uh, over the years. You know, I've done I think. I think I might have done four Buffy songs over the over the years, uh, Saskatchewan being the first. Right. Um, but uh, I, I unfortunately have never played a concert in Canada. So if there's anyone there who would like to, wow. I know it's a good country, but if there's anyone there who wants to get us over, you know, we would we would do everything we could to make that easy and achieve. Um, we'd be so happy to come and play in Canada. Um, and I think if we if we did, if, if it was promoted right, I think there are people in Canada who want to see us play. Sure. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm friends with people on the Apple Fest uh, committee. Uh, yeah. The area I live in is an apple orchard area, and we actually, you probably being in the music industry, you might be familiar with Colin James. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he played Brighton's Apple Fest to three okay. in 2019 or 2018. He, he, he was the last performer before everything got shut down. We haven't had Apple yeah. Fest for the past two years. You know, well, count us in. You know, if you think it can be done, we'd be delighted to come. Well, with think about it nowadays, and Gordon has said this before, every time one of the uh, actors, musicians, you name it, comes on the podcast, Something big happens for them. And you look at 2022, look at Kate Bush, a number one hit, you yeah. know, in 2022. And uh, Howard Jones song, uh, I think it was Things Can Only Get Better, featured on Stranger Things. And it yes. just blew up again, you yeah. know? So yeah. Simon, you're about to blow up in the US, right? Stranger Thank Things, Canada. better use one of your songs. Yeah, North America. No, I, I think we're not, you know what? I think we're not very typical of the 80s in terms of the sound of us, our oh, sound. No. no. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think your music is more, it, it, it's hard to pigeonhole. It's hard to say it's 80s, it's 90s, it's millennial. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Is because sure. there are elements of that what more the set what I find the 70s era in. Yeah, that's probably right. I mean, I think that uh, that era 70 to 75 or six, you know, I was just playing and listening to music every day of my life, you know, um hours and hours. Uh, so probably inevitably when I go and look at I look in my own little sort of creative cupboard, it's inevitable that some of the building blocks are, are, are recognizable. 
Uh, but I think everybody's are, you know. I, I had an interesting conversation about T-Rex. Do you remember T-Rex? Sure. They, they were a... I mean, it was a friend of mine, he's the same age as me, and he said, um, he's a very good bass player, and he said, oh, I, I made a remark, I was saying, I want to do a cover version just for festivals, for fun, of Get It On. I think you called it Bang A Gone um, by T-Rex, and that's a Mark Bowman song. But we got talking about Mark Bowman, and he said, you know, at the time, because he was the biggest pop star in England, I completely, completely snobbed it out, and I completely... I ignored the fact. I didn't even, even listen properly. But now, when somebody puts Get It On or Jeep on, they yeah. just absolutely leap out of the speakers, the energy and the warmth in that sound, you know. And his guitar playing on Jeepster is just fantastic. I mean, he was an absolute yeah. riff monster. So I think he's really underrated in those musician guitar player terms. Um, sure. And and that did have a big effect on my guitar playing because see, because they were quite simple songs. I could get the feel, and I wasn't I wasn't being too stretched sure. by the technicality. And I think what what's happening now is people get a bit obsessed about being able to do the left hand, the technical stuff of, uh, of the gymnastics of guitar playing. But actually, we all play chords the same. It's yeah. the right hand. It's the right hand that makes somebody stand out or not you know sure. Pete, Townsend, Pete Townsend's rhythm guitar it's just the, the best ever in the world and that's because of his right hand not his left yeah I'm sure you know I'm sure that's been said by others or, or something similar but uh, I never heard it quite put that way about the difference between the left hand being the technical and the right hand assuming you're right-handed <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's all about the rhythm and the feel yeah uh, Adrian, uh, uh, the reason I brought Adrian over is because it is now 8.22 in the morning in Eastern Standard Time, and my little guy is going off to summer camp. Oh, so. yeah. So we'll wrap this up. Simon, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, check out their website. We'll put their links in there. Uh, thanks so much.